So our speaker tonight uh, is Chris Rigby, and Chris was recently elected to the BCP Council, Bournemouth, Christchurch and Poole, I'm sure you all know that by now, representing the Green Party, he's an environmental and social justice campaigner, a Greenpeace volunteer and a coordinator of Extinction Rebellion Bournemouth. And I just asked him if he's got a day job as well, and he, he does have a day job four days a week. Uh, with in, um, environmentally friendly roofing and uh, I'm sure he can tell you more about that uh, if you'd like to know more about that. So um, it sounds as though uh, he's a very busy man so I'm um, very delighted that he's uh, found some time to come here to talk to us this evening. Will you please give Chris a very warm welcome. Thank you very much. Um, so, I was going to start by introducing myself, but David, thank you. I don't think I need to, really. Um, so, very, very briefly, um, I was elected in May after several years of campaigning, as well as um, being elected in May. I've run for the council once before in um, 2015, when I didn't get elected, and I've also run as well for um, Parliament twice to be the MP of Christchurch. So, a lot of what I do is based around the environment and around various environmental campaigns which I've been doing for a great number of years. Extinction Rebellion wise, um, I founded the BCP group along with three other people probably only about 12 months ago after Extinction Rebellion itself started around 18 months ago, something like that. So it is a very new group. But tonight, I'm not talking on behalf of the City Council, I'm not talking on behalf of the Green Party or Greenpeace or even Extinction Rebellion. What I'm going to be doing is giving you my own interpretation of how I see Extinction Rebellion and my own feelings on it and my own views on this particular talk which we give. This has been given up and down the country um, hundreds and hundreds of times to different people and it's really about heading for extinction and what to do about it, as it says. Um, what it is, we split this into two parts. Half of it is the science of climate change and the ecological collapse which we are currently going through. And the second half is about Extinction Rebellion itself and the tactics and why Extinction Rebellion does what it does. And um, you've probably seen the bigger events which go on like and the large protests which happened in London in October, in April, and then the previous October as well, where various areas of the city were closed down for up to two weeks at a time. And we get a lot of conversation around that, and a lot of people don't actually know the ins and outs of why it happens. They see it on the news, or they see something happening, and they think, oh, people are just out there doing this, and why? So I really want to focus on that, and also be able to answer your questions at the end as well. So, a few bits of this, I'm going to skip because this can take up to about an hour and a half, but we've got 50 minutes or so this evening. So, I'll do my best to fit it all in and cover everything in as much detail as I can. So, I think we can start with skipping that. So, a note about Extinction Rebellion. Extinction Rebellion is non-violent direct action, and I really want to focus on the non-violent. That is a huge part of what we do, and we partake in civil disobedience, and it is always non-violence. What the aim is, is to get governments to act on the climate and ecological crisis which we're facing. Um, what we want them to do is declare a climate and ecological emergency. This is one of our demands. In BCP Council, this is one of the first things which we actually did when, um, after I was elected, and the Unity Light Alliance took control of the council, we managed to get this passed, and we are looking to um, make BCP council net carbon zero by 2030, which isn't quite in line with the Extinction Rebellion aims, but it's very close, so we can talk a little bit about that as well. Now, this talk goes into some detail, particularly on the first half of it, and there have been times where it's been delivered where people feel a lot of different emotions because I don't think there's a lot of people now who kind of don't see some sort of climate change actually happening regardless of what your thoughts are of why and how and what's occurring 
we are not, we're past the point where it's hidden away, it's being reported on the news a lot, it's constantly in the media, and this is really, really good. When we first started this, that was again one of our aims to get this talked about. So when we go into it, people can feel different kinds of emotions as well, and a lot of it. Um, you feel you're surrounded by people who are also feeling those sort of emotions as well, and Extinction Rebellion also acts as well as a protest group in itself as sort of a home for people who have these feelings and it gives them a chance to be able to engage with other people who feel that way and feel as though they can speak and not feel judged in any way that they might do sort of speaking about it down the pub or in work or things like that. It's a very open and honest, safe environment. So as I said, there's two parts and we'll go on to part one, which is the climate and ecological crisis. So, the Earth, the Earth is our only life support system. This is where we all inhabit, us along with all of the flora and fauna which exists here. This is all we've got, our planet, and we've got to take care of it. I don't think a lot of people can really disagree with that at all. However, we are in the process of destroying it. And we're destroying its climate, its ecology, and also our own future as the human race. So if we take a look at climate to start off with and what it actually is. So greenhouse gases are what keeps the earth warm. It works exactly, we call it greenhouse gases, it acts like a greenhouse. It keeps the heat in. As the sun's rays come down, it um, Stay hits the earth, reflects outwards, and some of them are kept and maintained, so the earth maintains its own warmth. What we are doing is we are putting more and more and more of these gases into the atmosphere, and because of that, the earth is getting hotter and hotter. The two big culprits in this are carbon dioxide and methane. So most of the carbon dioxide which we're putting into the atmosphere at the moment is coming through the burning of fossil fuels, which is one of the major contributors towards climate change. We, if we look at this graph here, we can see what is occurring. We call this the hockey stick graph because of the way in which it's looping and the way in which it is exponentially increasing. Um, when we go back to the industrial age and when that first started, we were at around 280 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. When I was born, which was in 1984, we were at 340 parts per million in the atmosphere. Now, we're at around 410 to 415 parts, and that's increasing by one to two parts per million year on year from now, whereas it used to take a few years for this to increase. It is getting quicker and quicker and quicker. So, <clears throat> This is unprecedented throughout history. When we look at the global temperature, we can see that it directly correlates to this increase in greenhouse gases, which we've got. So if we go back again to the start of the industrial age, we can see a spike as we started to combust lots and lots of coal at the time to really drive forward. Um, the Industrial Revolution across the Western world. And ever since then, you can see this temperature doing as it has done for centuries. We have peaks and troughs, but there's been the steady increase going on and on and on. There has just been, at the start of this year, the Met Office has released a report. And in that report, they have said that the last decade is the hottest decade which has happened since records began. Within that decade, we've had not just the hottest year, but we've had the hottest five years on record as well. So this increase in temperature is just increasing. 2019 was the second hottest year which we had, and that was without an El Nino. An El Nino is a current which exists, and a wind which exists across the Atlantic, which actually increases heat, and it is includes these spikes here when we have one. 2019 did not have one. The last time we did was 2014 when we had that massive heat wave and we saw um, thousands and thousands of deaths due to heat across um, all of Europe at that time. 
So as we are increasing these greenhouse emissions, we're gradually going to continue increasing this temperature. And what we saw as an anomaly back in 2014 is going to become the norm. Um, if we go on to this, we can see again from 1850, it's just a visualisation of warming stripes. And you can see how this has changed and how we are looking at the gradual increase. As you can see at points, there's like slightly yellower bits coming in in earlier years where we have anomalies and spikes, which is always going to happen. And you can see there how it's getting um, really hot towards the end. So all of this is contributing to what we're seeing now. I mean, you only had to look at news reports at the start of this year, the end of last year, and what's been happening in Australia and the fires there. Um, that was predicted almost 20 years ago, that that was going to happen. The, there was a report which came out, which you may be aware of, in the UK, which was um, the Stern report back in 2006, which was done by um, an eco econ economist who um, said, we really need to act now and we need to reduce our emissions and that we should be putting 1% of our GDP into fighting climate change, otherwise it's going to cost us more in the future. We didn't act on that, so we're finding ourselves in this position now where it's going to start costing more and more to actually <coughs> fight this problem. The year after that, the opposition to the government in Australia commissioned their own report, and it had exactly the same findings, and within that, um, it was found that they would say there would be more bushfires year on year and that would be directly observable by 2020 <coughs> and we have seen that now. That report also says that by 2050 the number of fire days in Australia will be getting up to 200 days a year and that would only increase year on year. So we're seeing in parts of the Western world which could potentially become uninhabitable in our lifetimes. The major report which came out, which really kick-started the Extinction Rebellion movement, was the IPCC report, which is the um, Intergovernmental Project on Climate Change, and that is world governments coming together to discuss what should be happening. This report came out in, I think it was... 2018 and this is where the rhetoric came that we had 12 years to change to limit global warming to one and a half degrees and we really had to act immediately within those 12 years and otherwise we would see unprecedented changes from this report and um, was where extinction rebellion was really born and people were sort of shaken into action. We've been taking action in different ways for over 30 years. Myself personally, when I left um, sixth form, I went to do an apprenticeship and I'd done an apprenticeship in building services engineering and we had one module in sustainability. From that module, I went on to go and do a degree in renewable energy because I thought that that was really what was going to be happening to change the world. The investments would change, that we'd be shifting away from fossil fuels to really begin to make a change to a cleaner way to power our society and our way of lives. When I graduated, we that was 2008, and we saw the collapse of the banks, we saw ourselves go into massive austerity and the first thing that happened is renewable energy was cut from all sorts of government programmes. I myself found the brunt of that in the fact that I couldn't get a job. And so, you know, six years of studying overall, coming out from leaving a good job after my apprenticeship to taking the move into studying to feel this is the future, this is what we're going to be doing, to then find myself lugging trees around the garden centre for six to nine months while I was looking for work in the industry which I really felt was going to make a change. Now, when this IPCC report came out, 
and we stopped thinking about doing what we'd always done. We stopped saying we need to commission another government report to say what is going to be happening. We stopped commissioning reports saying these are the changes which we need to make because it wasn't making a difference. Everyone has signed petitions, people have been on marches, this was always happening, but it wasn't making a difference. So what, why are we making such a fuss about this and this particular report and also such a small temperature rise such as 1.5 degrees? What we're saying is that in this, this 1.5 degrees we're talking about an average temperature increase across the globe. That doesn't mean that we're going to see just a one degree shift upwards in all our temperatures around the globe. What it means is the curve of temperatures is going to move one and a half degrees towards the right. So if you look on the left here, um, what you can see is this could be any sort of temperature. Here is the northern hemisphere, summer temperatures. So you can see 1950 to 1980, we've got this curve here and it follows what we expect to see in winter and what we expect to see in summer. What we've now done is we've seen this shift and this year we know that since 1880 we have had one degree of global warming and this shift in the graph is what it represents and you can see on the left the number of cool days which we have has dramatically fallen because of this and the number of hot and extremely hot days which we have has dramatically increased. What this leads to is for us, we see warmer summers, milder winters. For people living close to the equator, they are seeing much, much less rainfall. They are seeing lack of water supplies. They are seeing water security falling down. At the poles, we are seeing ice sheets melting on a grand scale. We're losing ice in the uh, North Pole on an unprecedented level at the moment. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. So we have people who are saying that this warming happens, this has always happened throughout history, and that's the truth, it has always happened throughout history, but not like we're seeing it now. So this, I don't know how well you'll be able to see it at the back, but we're talking at the far left of this graph here is 500 million years before present, going right up to the present day on the far right hand side. So we see massive, massive fluctuations in temperature um, throughout that time and that's happened for a variety of reasons as the earth has settled, as continental drift has settled, as we've seen less volcanic explosions, as we've seen less um, impacts of meteors and such from space as our solar system has begun to settle down. So what we haven't seen is a two degree change for 130,000 years, which is a huge amount of time. This is pre-humanity, this is pre what we know today. So currently we're in the Holocene era. And the Holocene era is when we have really evolved as what we know and what we have um, on this planet today. We, um, sorry, we have this now and we've had this really temperate climate and that's allowed um, humanity to evolve and it's allowed us to completely colonise the globe as we have done. It has allowed us to get to the point we are now, we're building society, building community, building life as we know it. The changes in that time on temperature have been extremely, extremely minimal. And now, from the graph you saw earlier, we are accelerating that change to a point where we are not going to be able to just adjust back down to what we know and what we've seen a hundred years ago. And um, there have been periods like you've seen without, with these changes, but that's not where humanity has been around and we don't actually know whether humans would be able to survive in those conditions. We don't know if any of the animals and plants which we have today would be able to survive in those conditions. It's 
one of those things which is a complete unknown. So the impacts of this heating are being felt globally already. Um, like I said, we're at this one degree of warming and that again was in that Met Office report which has just come out this year. They are three different climate studies which show this one degree has happened and that's from the Met Office and that's also from NASA. It is evidenced by the three main research bodies into <coughs> climate change and what is happening. What you may have been aware of in the last few years is just more and more increasing reports of devastating weather events, extreme flooding. Um, the picture at the um, top of there is from um, Queensland, which was the end of a massive drought, which then found had really, really intensive rainfall, which had widespread flooding and killed around 500,000 cattle, which is massively significant, not just environmentally, but also economically as well. The picture at the top right, that is um, Chennai in India. A couple of years ago, that city ran out of water. Water had to be shipped in in containers, and people from the city were queuing just to fill up um, jugs or whatever they could with water, and that is a modern, thriving city. Um, again, pictures at the bottom. This one at the bottom is um, wildfires in California last year. And again, further flooding. Um, I can't remember where that one is actually. And as I said, this is becoming more and more prevalent. And it's not just being prevalent in places which seem like distant or faraway lands to us. This is happening in the UK as well. So, in the UK, 2003 heatwave, we saw 70,000 people killed in Europe. 2014, the worst rainfall in almost 250 years. Um, there is a report which, at the moment, Fairbourne in Wales, which is a small village in Wales, their council has decided it is not viable to build their flood defences. It is going to cost too much. So they are in the process of completely decommissioning an entire village and trying to rehouse people in other places, which this is not going to be a unique event. We talk about these things happening and we talk about how these sort of freak weather conditions or what we now think as freak weather conditions are going to become more and more prevalent. And as they do, we're not just talking about an environmental disaster, we're talking about a humanitarian disaster. We think now that we are seeing mass immigration across the world, people leaving their countries to move to places which they feel are safer or where they feel there are resources or they feel there are jobs. As we see availability of water drying up or increases in temperatures, that become beyond our ability to exist, we're going to see movement of people beyond anything which we have ever seen before. And as you can see from this and this village, that's not just going to be people moving from one country to another. This is going to be people moving around within their own country, moving to higher lands, moving to where sea levels are not rising. This is going to happen. And when this sort of thing happens, we can't just lift up the bridges and say, people can't move, this isn't going to happen. We are going to see movement on a scale which I don't think we'll have ever seen on this planet before. And when we see movement like that, and when we see scarcity of resources, it always leads to one thing, and that thing is always armed conflict. So we're going to see a huge change in the way that our world works. And we've all seen films of post-apocalyptic futures and it seems like a distant sci-fi dream. But it's not too far away from happening and it may not happen immediately. It's not going to happen possibly in my lifetime. 
But in the next generation's lifetime, this is something which we could really, really see happening where people are battling over resources. <clears throat> there are additional studies which have been done, and it includes this country as well, that we could just be 30 crop cycles away from not having enough nutrients in the, so in the soil to sustain more growth. Once that begins to happen, what do we do? How do we feed not just ourselves? How do we feed everyone? How do we feed our livestock? How do we feed and water everyone on this planet? So this is what's going to happen. So what do we do? Is it business as usual? We have got sea level rise. There's a really interesting map. You can go on to map sea level rise and it'll show you areas around the world if you put in if sea levels rise one metre, what's going to happen if sea levels rise two, three, four, where is water going to come to? With two metres sea level rise, we're going to start seeing massive amounts of flooding in areas around the, um, the coast in the UK. This is going to be focused mainly in the east, in Norfolk, but we're also going to see it in parts of Devon, Cornwall, Brighton, and um, parts of the north and Scotland as well, particularly the islands. Well, it's not discriminate. It's just going to happen to everyone. It doesn't matter about wealth. It doesn't matter about what you've got. It's where you are and what happens there. The problem comes from who's causing these issues and why are these issues being caused. So there's an interesting study again which shows that 40% of all global emissions which are contributing to these sorts of things and these sorts of weather conditions brought on by climate change is being done by the top 1% of um, wealth in the world. Yet the people who are going to be affected most of the bottom 50% of wealth in the world because it is going to start happening in third world countries first and this is where the movement's going to happen and we in my opinion as the western world have a responsibility to everyone throughout this planet and to everything which lives on this planet to begin to do something about this what we're going to find though, even if we start making changes now, these small changes which we're making to bring on some renewable energy, to bring on looking at reducing our own personal emissions, talking about impacts which we can take as individuals, is not going to be enough. We may already be reaching a point where we hit what we call positive feedback loops and there is nothing positive about them. Positive feedback loop is, for example, a major one would be the North Pole. We're getting to the point where in the summer there is unlikely to be any ice on the North Pole. Currently, the ice which exists there in the summer months reflects a lot of the heat back out. It's white, it's reflective, and it'll reflect the heat. Once that melts and we've got greenery or soil, that's going to absorb the heat. In recent years there have been temperature changes in the northern polar regions which show that they are out of sync by up to 30 degrees at certain times of the year and that change is only accelerating this melting of the polar ice caps once that begins it's really difficult to predict exactly how the earth is going to respond one thing which scientists are worried about, and I'm, I'm not a scientist, I'm an engineer, I can only go on what information is out there and what I've been told and what I've read. But one major thing is methane, which is being released from the permafrosts and undersea methane stores. Now, if this happens, we don't know how much methane there actually is. And methane is a much, much, worse greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, up to four times worse in the effects which it has. The one advantage it has is that it breaks down in the atmosphere and becomes recycled back down to earth. However, that can take up to 40 years 
at 40 years is far too late. So we ha are really facing this massive, massive problem with our climate. Unfortunately, it's only half of the problem. We are also, at the same time as we're doing this, destroying the planet's ecology. Now, when, when we inherited this earth, when we evolved and we became the dominant species, we came into a really rich world full of life, full of plants, full of animals, of all sorts. Even back when I was in school, there was massive amounts of biodiversity. I remember when I first started driving, and I used to drive down to Cornwall, and I'd drive down in the summer to go surfing from Liverpool. When I would get there, I had a little white Fiat. It was absolutely covered in insects. Now, if I make the same drive from here back up to Liverpool, I've got a van, and there's barely anything on it. This is the change which we can actually see here and now. We are destroying the land and the oceans. Intensive agriculture is replacing wilderness. You only have to look as far as the UK to see how much of our land is farmland and how little we have left in trees and particularly ancient woodland. We still continually try to cut these down. At the moment, um, Extinction Rebellion activists are um, fighting against HS2. That's going through around 130 ancient woodlands which they want to clear to get this in place. We need to keep what we have got. Um, I'm wearing a t-shirt, it says Jungle Was Massive. I was involved in a campaign against um, the cutting down of rainforests, which is a lot of you'll see or may have seen for um, palm oil. And whereas palm oil is a brilliant, brilliant resource for us, for the oils which we need, for many, many things that we do, the fact that we don't try and utilise the land area which we have available to us and increase the yield from that, but insist on just burning more forest to clear paths for it is decimating what we have got. <clears throat> what this also does is it reduces the amount of carbon which these trees can reabsorb. Trees are brilliant, grasslands are brilliant, heathlands is brilliant at taking carbon back from the atmosphere and recycling it. And this is the balance this planet has always had. And now we are changing that. We are digging up and burning life from millions of years ago, which is buried in the ground, and we're putting that carbon into the atmosphere. At the same time, we are getting rid of our carbon sinks. What we're going to end up with is deserts. And deserts cannot sustain life. They cannot be used by barely anything has evolved to live in pure desert regions. The ocean, as well, is just as vital to our survival. It's not just the land. Oceans, again, are carbon sinks. What everything which trees do, we have um, other photosynthesizing organisms, such as photoplankton, which pull carbon out of the air and lock it into the oceans and recycle it down into the seabed. Um, and again, oceans as well they supply a lot of food. As we increase the amount of carbon and the oceans can't deal with this, they become acidified, and acidified oceans cannot sustain life. We need to ensure that we preserve what we have got, and the only way we can do it is to really make vast changes and act now on it. Oceans heat in reduces the amount of oxygen which is devolved, like I said, it increases the acidity and it's also affecting the currents. Like I was saying about uh, the Arminos before, this is changing 
And if we don't have these weather cycles moving and our currents moving, it has another effect on our weather and by and part our way of life as we currently know it. We are in the sixth mass extinction now. It has begun and we are accelerating into it. There has been five other mass extinctions. The most known one is of course when the dinosaurs went extinct. Um, that was due to the meteor hitting the earth and what followed with that. Every other mass extinction has been to do with carbon and greenhouse gases and changes of climate. Every single time we we define this by losses of over 60 to 75 percent of all species on earth that had evolved at that time. 60 to 75 percent as a minimum. One of these extinctions saw 90 percent of all life on earth go out of existence. Can we afford to see that happen again? We've got one in four species at risk of extinction. These aren't just the big ticket animals that you see. These aren't just the polar bears. These aren't just the pandas. These aren't just the rhinoceros. There's an animal. It's one of my favorite animals. I absolutely love them, puffins. I've got this connection to puffins. I had loads of puffin books when I was a kid. I still do. I see it as a symbol of the UK, of one of the animals which we've got. That's a beautiful looking bird. You can go around our coast. You can see them all over the place. In the year 2000, a study was done on puffins in the Shetlands and it was found that there was 33,000 puffins living in the Shetland Islands at that time. In 2018, another um, report was done and they went back to look at the puffins on the Shetlands there were 570 individuals found there at the same time of year. This is just to do with climate change. Their food sources, which they rely on, cannot survive in the slight temperature change which has happened. The puffins have nothing to eat. They're moving, they're changing where they're living. They are not able to survive in these conditions and they are becoming under threat. Ten thousand years ago, ninety-nine percent of life on Earth was wild animals. One percent was humans. We have evolved. We are the most intelligent being on this planet, and we have evolved and we have moved to every single corner of the globe. We're now thirty-six percent of life on Earth. Sixty percent is the livestock which we have to sustain our eating habits. 4% left is wild animals. This is not the planet the way it was designed. We have changed it. We have used our intelligence. We have used our ability to take our domination of this planet. And now we have to use the same intelligence we are the only species who know that we are going to become extinct. Nothing else does. But conversely, we are also the only ones who can do something about it. We inherited this rich world. And I think we need to ensure that descendants of ours have a right to enjoy it as well, in the same way that we have in the same way that we get to experience nature and wildlife and everything which we have on this planet to visit. Destroying our food web, we're destroying our futures. Destroying our environments, we're destroying our futures. This is a climate and an ecological emergency and we need to do something about it. What we normally do when we're doing this speech is just have a minute for everyone to sort of like take on board what has been said, have a think about it, sort of have a moment. But with 
time being as it is, I'm just going to have a quick drink of water. <laughs> but um, we'll carry on. <coughs> And we'll go into part two. And I know that first bit took a while. And um, this one is the less grief stricken one. This is more about Extinction Rebellion and what we can actually do. So, we need to overcome the collective denial of the ecological crisis. What that means is what I was alluding to before. We need to stop just getting these reports and producing them. We need to do something about it. We need to act on it. And this is why Extinction Rebellion have come into being. We have a moral obligation to act on it. Why didn't we do something about it while well, we could? We should be doing something about it. What we do about it, we might differ on. But I'm going to tell you what I do about it and what I hope other people would want to do about it. We've got an obligation to everyone alive, to everyone who will be alive, and to ourselves, and to everything else which is sharing this planet with us. When we look at it in this way, it becomes not why should we fix this, but how can we not fix this? So let's do something. What have we tried to do? The Kyoto Agreement is what made me really start thinking about the environment, and that's why I wanted to do this renewable energy and go down that route. The Paris Agreement, which people are pulling out of left, right and centre, was the next big thing. We can't let governments and big business run this. We cannot do it. We need to take ownership of our planet and do something about this. What have we tried to do locally? I can't tell you the amount of times I've written to an MP in the different places that I've lived. I can't tell you the amount of campaigns, marches that I've been on, how I've completely changed my lifestyle to, from small things such as walking everywhere I can to stopping flying like I used to and taking holidays. I try to limit that as much as I possibly can do to changing my diet completely and really changing the way that I view how I live my life. Individual action isn't enough. There are billions of people on this planet. It would take everyone to do it, and we need to be led. This graph shows where all of these different things have happened, all of these reports, and what's been happening with the CO2 concentrations as we've been doing it. I'd have liked to have thought it might have made a difference. It's not. It's continued and continued to rise on not just the same trajectory, but actually increasing. Fossil fuel usage is continuing to skyrocket. We are getting more renewable energy. We are getting better energy efficient products. We are insulating buildings better. It doesn't matter. We are still burning massive amounts of fossil fuels. There are not a lot of other things that we do now that we were doing in the 1800s, yet we continue to do that. We continue to use the same method. Everything else we refine, we make better, we learn. We are not learning, we are repeating mistakes from the past. Why hasn't it worked? Why haven't these reports been doing anything? And I'm gonna say something that you're not gonna hear many politicians say. Democracy isn't working. <laughs> The problem with democracy is it's short term. We elect governments every five years. Governments make promises to get elected in that short period. We want quick fixes to our problems. This is not a quick fix. We also have a failure to cost the future from the way in which we live our lives. What I'm saying is we take into account the cost of everything we buy. You want to buy a new television, a new laptop, you think, what's the best I can afford? Is it going to last me? What can I get for my money? The thought isn't, 
what damage might this do? What is this going to affect in the future? Can I do something which is going to be more sustainable? We haven't learnt that. We haven't been taught that from a young age. It's no individual's fault. It's the problem with society as a whole. And realistically, no one is to blame for that. The other thing is we need action to be global. The amount of times I stand and I talk to people and someone will shout, what about China? What about America? What about India? Yes, we all need to make change. It needs to be global, but the globe needs leaders. And we've led before, and we can lead again. And we need a new approach, because nothing has been working so far. So what is this new approach? I declared myself in open rebellion against our government and its policies on climate change, along with thousands and thousands of other people. In two weeks' time, I'm in court for being arrested for blocking a road in London. And I saw that as my moral obligation to do something different. Like I said at the start, XR has only been going since 2018, but I believe it's got more attention for this issue than anything else which has gone before it. Regardless of agreement with its methods, what it does, it has completely changed the conversation on climate change and the environment. We are global, mostly focused in Western countries, but we have um, branches and actions which have taken across all the world. And this has been completely um, organic happening. People have seen what's happened and they've taken it upon themselves to do something. Because anyone can be a part of XR as long as you follow its 10 values. <coughs> we use civil disobedience, non-violent direct action. This has been used time and time again from people, as you can see here, one that I was a little bit shocked by, actually. Um, in September, it was someone called Ruby Bridges' birthday. She was the first um, African-American to go into a segregated school when she was six years old. She was 65 in September. That's happened in my parents' lifetime. That's happened in a lot of your lifetime. That is something which we see now as nothing segregation is something in the past. And again, it was because of non-violent action taken by people who really made a stand to make a difference. And it makes a difference time and time again. This does involve doing things which are illegal. It does involve doing something which flouts the rules. If you follow the rules, you don't get attention. As soon as you slightly step outside the box, you start to get attention. And attention is what makes a difference. Attention is what starts conversations. And it's what really brings movements to the forefront. We want to create a tipping point. A tipping point is 3.5% of people coming together to really make a difference, stand shoulder to shoulder and say, we are not going to let this continue as it is. To openly cause disruption, to openly inconvenience people. And it's unfortunate, and I do feel sorry for the people who are inconvenienced, but the small inconvenience for a few days, a week, today, is nothing compared to the inconvenience which we are going to suffer. One other thing, it should be fun. If we want people to come and stand together, we don't want it to be all doom and gloom. It needs to be engaging. It needs to make people interested. It needs to make people want to get involved. We use art, music, um, all sorts of different ways to approach people. And there is room for absolutely everyone in what Extinction Rebellion do. What do we want? There's three demands. To tell the truth, which means declaring that we are in an emergency situation. 
to act now, reduce and stop the use of carbon and have it at net zero by 2025, and to have citizens' assemblies on climate and ecological justice. And this is what I mean by saying democracy is not working. Democracy is short term. A citizens' assembly, which involves the selection of random citizens from across the country to hear from experts, to review evidence, to make decisions and advise the government on what should be doing, is what we need. They are not bought and sold by big businesses. They have no investment except their own life, their own lifestyle, their own belief. And that should come from a cross-section of society. It has worked in other countries. This was used in Ireland for the abortion debate. And their sister's assembly, when that came to the referendum, almost identically mirrored the final referendum results. So this really does show what the public is thinking. Why 2025? It means do it now. Now is what matters. Any later date, it's kicking it into the long grass, it's leaving it for the next government, it's leaving it for the next generation. We shouldn't be doing it. What sacrifices have generations before ours made so we can have the life we do now? And what sacrifices are we willing to make so that generations ahead of us can live a life like we know now? The current government target is 2050. It's not enough. They base it on technologies which don't exist. What is the motivation to hit 2050? There is none. We need to act now. People are dying now. Animals are going extinct now. We need to do something about it. The Citizens' Assembly is really important for this because it involves the citizens and because each and every one of us is just as important as each other, the people you're sat next to, the people you go home to, the people you sit next to on a bus, whoever. Everyone has an equal right to this planet. So everyone needs to be involved in this decision making. I feel like I skipped ahead there. Um, as I said, it's free from corporate influences. It represents everyone and it becomes trusted. It's trusted by people because it's made up of the people. How we work, as I've been saying, we're non-violent. We do not do violence. As soon as you commit an act of violence, the authorities know how to handle you. They are used to dealing with violence. The police deal with violence every Friday and Saturday night. As soon as you confront them with something non-violent and give them a dilemma, they don't know how to act because how would they, when they don't experience this mass movement of people just being slightly disobedient? We're decentralised. We don't have a leader. We don't have a central organising group. We don't have anything. Everything that XR does is run by its members. Anyone can feed into it. Anyone can be a member of Extinction Rebellion. We don't discriminate at all. We have a regenerative culture, which means we recognise that confronting this crisis is emotional, it's difficult, and a lot of people see this, and when you hear it and you're sat on your own, you think, what is the point? Why should I change anything if no one else is? You reach a point of almost despair. When you're surrounded by people who care, you can you know that you're not alone, you've got that support network and it empowers you to do more. A lot of people I speak to say it's the best community which they have ever been a part of and I really do believe that it is a community. It is not a rabble of people kicking off for attention. It's people with a deep connection to our environment and to each other. Our core activities are the actions which we do. Small actions, local actions which we've done in Bournemouth. I've said I'll talk about those a little bit so I can update you maybe in the Q&A a little bit. And obviously the big national actions which you see. 
We have had now over 3,000 people be arrested for this cause. That is brilliant. But for every single person who has been arrested, there's 10 more who haven't and don't want to be, but are members and support these people. And that's what's important. This support, in fact, it's gone up. Okay, there's 20 plus other people for everyone who's been arrested, which is even better. Um, there's roles for everyone. There's roles for artists. There's roles for people who want to get involved and just moderate Facebook pages. There's roles for people who want to give talks like I'm giving now. There's roles for people who want to start their own local group. There's something for everyone, regardless of age, regardless of colour, regardless of sexuality, it is the most inclusive environment because everyone is bonded by their desire to see change. So, like I said, if it was something anyone wanted to get involved with, it is something which is new. It's only been going since the middle of 2018 and it has made massive change and it has massively changed the conversation around this issue. For me, being involved is massive, being involved in pol green politics for I don't know how long, Greenpeace for 10 plus years as an MVD activist, we haven't managed to get the change in the conversation that Extinction Rebellion have and I'm incredibly grateful to be a part of it. If you were interested, there's a few bits and pieces there, but for now, Thank you for listening to me and I'm looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, okay, as usual, we're going to uh, pass the mic around and uh, hopefully we, we will uh, have eliminated some of our technical hitches, but uh, let's see how it goes. So. Um, do we have anyone? Yeah, Ro Ronnie is first up. So, uh, Dean, if you'd like to come and give the mic to Ronnie. Thank you. Um, first off, I'd like to say I do agree with what you're saying, the motivation, the outcomes you want. I definitely agree with that. However, looking back to, I think it was October of last year, the protests in London, Mm. Trains weren't going, people couldn't commute around London to work. <clears throat> Do you feel that, yes, this sort of action does give you exposure? Are you afraid of alienating people, annoying people, that this sort of action might actually be deterring them from your cause rather than encouraging them to join it? Thank you. Um, I've answered this question a lot. <laughs> And this is a debate which has gone on internally with members of Extinction Rebellion and there's no right or wrong answer to this question. Everyone holds their own opinion on it. So I can only answer from my perspective, not as a voice of Extinction Rebellion. What we have is 10 guiding principles and as long as an action follows those 10 guiding principles, then it is welcomed under the banner of Extinction Rebellion. Now, the one you referred to, people climbing on top of the tube and stopping that, that has probably caused the most debate internally within XR, with a lot of people saying, yeah, this action is something. It really raised awareness. It got massive national media attention. It upset a large number of people as well and made it difficult for them to get to work. People have to earn a living, people have to get to work, people have to survive. Now, the people who undertook that were willing to go to prison for their belief in this cause, and they see that as something which they should be doing. Personally, I think that action was okay. Now, People say it's disrupting public transport, people are going to go and jump in their cars and do that and it's going to contribute more to um, emissions. However, the disruption, although it looked, it looked horrible, 
let's let's be really honest about it. It looked terrible. And the videos, which were all over social media, and the news of people being pulled off the train, I didn't I didn't like it personally. But I believe that when something like that happens, as we get closer and closer to a point where we're going to be hitting irreversible climate and ecological damage, and if the only way to create change is to increase the level of these actions, then they are all viable. People talk about um, the suffragette movement and how powerful it was in getting women the vote, and the images are of women locked onto railings and standing placards and doing things like that. We don't talk about the fact they were also doing bombings. That happened. So what we remember in history is what we want to remember. And what we see now as disruption, what will we see that as in the future? So it sort of puts the question back onto everyone else as to where do you see the line yourself? And everyone has their own choice regardless of whether they're in XR or not. And I hope in a roundabout way that kind of answers it. Okay, uh, John McBeck. Thank you for... Hello? Hello? Yes. Th thank you for uh, an excellent talk, first of all. Um, I I'd, I'd like to ask, uh, along the same sort of lines, but, but from a different perspective, uh, you, your line is non-violence. It, it, it has to be non-violent. Now, there are different interpretations of what violence is, of course. Um, it, uh, violence against people is one thing. Violence against uh, um, property is something that, as you say, was done by the suffragettes and, and generally now is thought to have been justifiable. Now, if I could just put a, 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 a sort of philosophical question to you, I suppose. Um, if it could be shown that uh, blowing up um, a number of oil fields, say, or uh, a number of coal mines uh, would significantly re improve the, uh, the chance of avoidance of catastrophe, and, and that's a big if, but if it could be shown that that could be done without loss of human life, would that be justifiable? It's something that I, I, I'm not sure of myself. That is quite a philosophical question, isn't it? Um, He's got a degree in philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> I feel proud on the spot. <laughs> Personally, I couldn't advocate that. Um, I would see that there would be other methods to achieve the same outcome. Um, if you're talking about causing damage like that and set, like you say, blowing up an oil field or something like that, potentially the environmental damage from doing that would be just as catastrophic as burning it in a different way. I don't believe that we need to resort to any violence to achieve our aims in this. And I don't advocate violence in any way. What I was interested in was what you said a little bit before that as well, and like people's different views on violence. And I do a really fun exercise in um, some of the training courses which I lead, and we call it a, um, a spectrum. And we do a spectrum line. And we make one side of a room violence and one non-violence, and we give people a scenario. And we say, put yourself somewhere along this line on what you perceive as violence. The spread of different people's interpretations is massive. I've got mine, everyone else has theirs. So, personally, to answer your question, I wouldn't advocate that. Would someone else? Perhaps. But for me, that is not an Extinction Rebellion action in any way, shape or form. And it's nothing which I would ever personally want to be a part of or ever advocate anyone taking part in. Okay, quite a few hands going up now. Let's, let's take Sally uh, next and then I'll get to uh, Paul and Simon and Jeremy and you, you, yes. Okay, thank you for your talk. Um, 
going back to the citizens' assemblies, um, I'm wondering, I can't quite see why they would be immune from influence by big business or other vested interests. Why could pe the people in the citizens' assembly not be bribed just like any other people, you know, like jurors potentially, um, you know, or, or ex sitting MPs or anything else? What makes them immune from being so susceptible to that sort of pressure? Um, <coughs> or comes to that threats against their person or their families. I mean, why are they safe from all this? Realistically, no one is free from that temptation, if you will, to take a bribe. The way that citizens' assemblies are um, selected is sortition. So it is exactly the same way that a jury is selected. Now, it's... It's probably a bigger question, isn't it? Like you said, how open are jurors to external influence and bribes? And what do we do to protect them from it happening? So I would like to view it in the same way, in the fact that they should be free of outside influence. This should be the dedication for the period of time which they are a part of that particular citizens' assembly, because this would constantly, theoretically, be moving, and the people and the sortition would change, and each would have a varying topic or idea to discuss on. So it wouldn't be we have sitting people for X number of years who are very much in the public eye. It would be more there is a large group of people who are dealing with this particular issue. So I'd like to, without having any answer myself, to think that we would protect them in a, a similar way to what we do already, people who are chosen to partake in um, events like that serving the public. Okay let's, uh, um, okay, let's take Mary next as she's nearer, and then we'll get to Simon. <coughs> Hello, uh, thank you for that talk. I've got three questions actually. I've heard that XR is corporate driven. Is this the case and who are the corporations? And also is, well, given that the trees are being cut down all around the world to accommodate the infrastructure as well as the multiple health issues, is XR opposing 5G? And also, do you know what the decision was by the local council with regards to having 5G in this area after the debate last year? Thank you. Okay. Let me answer them backwards, because I remember the last question. Um, so, the council has um, passed its Smart Cities Bill, which incorporates 5G. Unfortunately, or the council has its hands tied, as does every single local council, because 5G is covered by national planning policy, so local councils can't make any decision on it. Um, with regards to XR's position, we are a single issue group. Um, with regards to 5G, we don't hold a position. Members in it hold their own positions. We focus on our three demands, which I went through before. Should tree felling or mass happen, I believe that we would oppose that, but it would not be under the banner of being for or against 5G. It would be due to the um, destruction of the environment. And the first question, I'm going to test my memory, was about corporate sponsorship of Extinction Rebellion. Not to my knowledge, we have several large donors. Um, some of these you can go on and you can find out who these large donors are. Nothing is secret. We don't have any sponsorship. We don't have anyone who is paid to be anything with an Extinction Rebellion. Some people have expenses covered for certain things which they will go and do but there is no salary, no one makes a living from it, and there is no um, 
a sponsorship from a corporation with an agenda. As I said, everything is flat structure, so everything comes from the membership. Okay, thank you. Um, right, let's get to Simon and we'll get to you, Paul. Yeah, but thanks for the very interesting talk. Um, so what I want to say is that I feel really pretty guilty listening to you because um, I'm one of the great beneficiaries of the fantastic success of capitalism and globalization which has had wonderful positive effects and pretty, you know, some pretty terrible effects that you've been outlining. Um, so my guilt stems around uh, Amazon use, books, all sorts of kind of rare objects, um, pottering around in my little car, going off on some foreign holidays, uh, you know, the, all the usual bourgeois stuff. Um, to achieve what you're talking about, the sort of act now, you know, suddenly we've got a green government, we're going to change direction completely, are you really talking about a different kind of society where we have rationing, maybe, like we had in the war, you know, you say, well, you know, this is how many goods you can consume, it's not consumption is no longer have as much as you can get, it's a different approach. And, and does rationing, you know, you're really talking about um, not a capitalist society, but a much more top-down authoritarian sort of society, really, to, to achieve what you're talking about? So, I guess... You said you've said a lot of things there, and it is it is a massive it is a massive question of what what do we do, and Extinction Rebellion doesn't have doesn't have answers. They're asking for answers to come from a citizens' assembly. Like I said, I'm speaking on behalf of myself, so I can give you my personal views. Um, firstly, I'm as guilty as anyone else of taking part in society. We all are, you know, and I don't think we have to necessarily feel a guilt for partaking in all that we've known. Um, one of the um, core beliefs of XR, I've, I keep going on about these ten, I feel like I might just read them out to you in a moment if that's, in fact, can I do that now and then I'll come back because it kind of fits in. Um, so, one to ten, we have a shared vision of change, creating a world which is fit for generations to come. We set our mission on what is necessary. <clears throat> we need a regenerative culture. We openly challenge ourselves and the toxic system. We value reflecting and learning. We welcome everyone and every part of everyone. We actively mitigate for power. We avoid blaming and shaming. We are a non-violent network and we're based on autonomy and decentralization. And I think these 10 values are really important for actually society as a whole, which is why I wanted to read this and come back to it. The ones which particularly stick out for me is um, avoiding blaming and shaming, and that we don't blame the individuals for what we're doing. We talk about what we do and whether it be, I think there should be an authoritarian system saying we should go back to a wartime type situation. Maybe that needs to happen, I, I don't know, I don't know. But I would, I would hate to think of an authoritarian, top-down, structured system. That is not something I believe in, in any part of my life, including my political side. I believe in community. And I think with knowledge comes power, if you know what we are aiming towards and you know what is happening and you know what we need to do, then within your own community you can make those decisions of what needs to happen. You don't need to be told. We don't need someone saying you must, you must, you must. We are all for the most part good conscious people and I truly believe that most people do want to do their best in general and I might differ on views with a lot of people about a lot of different things, but I believe that their views they hold because they think that's actually the best for society as a whole. 
So I, I genuinely think we can arrive at this answer by looking inside ourselves and looking at our neighbours and looking into our communities on what we're willing to do. Like I said earlier in the talk, what sacrifices have generations before us made for our lifestyle and what sacrifices are we willing to make ourselves for future generations' lifestyle? Okay, let's get to Paul. Yeah, I'll get to you, Jeremy. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. Um, I've got a couple of comments and, and a suggestion. Um, first comments just on Citizens' Assembly. I'm not sure to what extent people are familiar with them here. I just wanted to say that they are widely in use across the world. They are shown to add value and uh, Britain has come fairly late to the party. Examples that spring to mind, oddly, would be both the United States and China, uh, where they're used in conjunction with local government. Uh, so there's quite a lot going on. Um, second comment was just in relation to philosophy, as probably most of you know. There's a lot of philosophical background in support of direct action which is unlawful under certain circumstances within democracies. Um, not to be long-winded, two names that spring to mind, David Thoreau in the US and of course Bertrand Russell in the UK. So when the, uh, when the cause is just, and we can figure that one out, but in this case I would say it is, um, go for it and thank you for what you do. The suggestion is we've just had a general election. Um, my crude observation was that at least four of the parties, Lib Dems, Greens, Labour and the SNP, uh, all put an incredible amount of effort into coming up with their um, green and climate change proposals. I'm suggesting there was an incredible amount of overlap. Um, I'm absolutely with you on the need to move from planning to action in various ways. But is there not some way that all that effort couldn't be brought together into a national program, a national movement, of which maybe you would be the active arm, um, rather than operating separately? Might save a lot of people a lot of time. Please. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm very much in agreement. One of the um, core parts of XR, which you might have seen on a lot of banners and a lot of um, the artwork which we do as well is something that we should call, let's say, beyond politics. Because some things are beyond politics and this is really one of them. And I'm very, very much in favour of working together with as many people and groups as I possibly can do. And I believe a lot of people share that vision as well. And I hope that it does begin to materialise and that we can go into the future with something which unites um, everyone who wants to make a difference on this side. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Let's get to Jeremy. And yeah, I'll get to you, Eric, uh, eventually. Yeah. Thanks very much indeed, and um, once again, thank you <coughs> excuse me, for a very informative and interesting talk. Um, but what I would like to say, um, uh, right off the bat, is that I'm very disappointed by the um, so-called direct action which Extinction Re Rebellion is taking right now, and I'll tell you precisely why I'm disappointed. Um, I'm very disappointed, disappointed because it seems to be extremely unfocused. Instead of concentrating, to give you one example, on the, um, the worst polluters, and we all know who those are, at least in this group here and, uh, and educated people, let's say, know by now who the worst polluters are. The Chinese, followed by the Americans, followed by the Indians, um, and, ver and various other nations too, uh, particularly Indonesia, Brazil, and so forth. Why is Extin Extinction Rebellion not focusing? Why is it not targeting the worst polluters? In other words, let me be specific. Why, why is Extinction Rebellion, instead of organizing mass, frankly rather silly, protests in Whitehall, blocking traffic and causing commuters massive inconvenience, why are you not targeting 
the worst pollutants by having mass demonstrations outside the, the Chinese embassy, outside the Indian embassy, outside the American embassy, etc., etc. And uh, Brazilian embassy too, obviously, because of all the damage they're doing to the rainforest. Why are you not doing that? I like the idea. Um, I'm British. I've got a government, and my government is choosing not to take action. Now, I would love Extinction Rebellion groups, self-organising groups, as we are, to, as they have done, spring up around the world and take direct action in their country. Again, which they have done, particularly in America. Yes, China are big polluters. Yes, Brazil is. Can I tell you about one of our local MPs, Connor Burns? When the Brazilian fires were taking place, clearing for, um, rainforest to go and plant more palm, more soy, and grow more cattle, Connor Burns was in Brazil negotiating a trade agreement with Brazil. Our government, who I am in open rebellion against, are out there negotiating these trade deals with those countries. Do you know what I want to say? Stop. Stop negotiating those trade deals. Stop bringing their products to our country that we can choose or not choose to buy. We should be looking after what we can and what we can affect. Negotiating new trade deals with these massive polluters, America, China, Brazil, is not going to fix anything. Trade blockades will. And we have the power within our government to do that. And that is what I'm focused on. I mean, it's sort of um, like mutated a little bit due to all the comments. Okay, yeah. um, but the idea is, I mean, without a doubt, I, I thought straight away that the conversation is bigger than it's ever been. Divisive. Um, points all across the board, but there's an actual conversation which is hugely different from what it was before. So that's great. Um, but we had this um, presentation which was really informative, except for one thing, like what do we literally do? You know, besides the fact of how do we get the attention, but what do we ourselves do? And I sort of, I'll tell you why I'm going in the direction. Oftentimes, there's a, an opinion, don't do this and then we do something opposite to replace it. And that thing is just as damaging. For example, let's um, not use fossil fuels. Let's go to battery power. And then there's civil war and child labor to produce those batteries. Um, how can we, what do we do? Is there even a solution to do something? I mean, it's a bit nihilist, I'm sorry, but is there even a solution to do something that's genuinely beneficial? And how do we stop that discussion? Um, <coughs> excuse me. Again, um, the three demand, the citizens assembly is what would say what should be happening because that would be influenced by experts who know what options are available. Again, personally, take everything else aside, this is just me <coughs> talking. I think there are multiple different ways which we can go. Technology exists now which we can use. Granted, and I don't think we necessarily need to jump on the technology bandwagon. We don't need to replace everyone's car with a battery-powered car. Because real, really, do we all need our own individual transportation? Or do we need better public transportation? Do we need jobs which are closer to home? Do we need more working from home? You know, there are things which are very, very basic changes. We're used to a lifestyle where if you want to go out and get your shopping, you just jump in the car and you shoot up the supermarket and you get what you need and you come back. Are there better ways to mitigate that journey? Yes, there probably are. Everyone has their own choices to make as well on an individual level. And I would never tell anyone not to do something. That's that's not in my gift, you know? I don't want to tell people what to do. I want to tell people how I feel about things, and I want everyone to make their own decision on what they feel is the best thing to do. Um, 
like we said about change, I know that there's some things which, which can't happen. There's the whole carbon capture story, which people say, if we can just capture carbon, we can just carry on like we are and go like that. Um, last year, I'm so happy I'm on the right page of my notes. Um, so there's 37 large carbon capture facilities around the world at the moment, and they capture 30 million tonnes of carbon dioxide every year, which sounds massive. However, the world's energy sector, just the energy sector, emits over 32 gigatons of carbon dioxide a year. Carbon capture is not scalable. It is not going to solve our problems. So we really need to not replace one thing with another or replace one idea with another or rely on something new which is going to come and solve all our problems. Personally, I believe we just all need to look at the way which we exist and we currently have society today and make a change. It even involved going back a little bit. I mean, fashion is a massive problem. People will go to somewhere like I know, a high street shop, whichever one it might be, and go up, be like, oh, I've got, I've got a hole in my shirt. I need to go and get a new one. You'll pop out and buy a new one for 10, 15 quid, whatever. Um, when I was a kid, I'd get a hole in my shirt at school, my mum would sew it back together. You know, it's, it's little things like that where we can all make change and reduce that little bit of impact. And every little change that we make reduces what we have to manufacture, which in turn reduces what we're emitting. And little changes on their own don't make a difference, but a shift in the way which we think about things really will make a massive difference, and that's what I think the solution actually is. Okay, uh, let's get to Eric, and then we'll come back to you, Jeremy, and that's anyone else's. Maybe a very short question. Okay, um, Eric was next in line, so... Uh... Thank you. Uh, having uh, travelled and worked and lived uh, in Europe, Africa, Asia, Australasia, I've seen many types of climate and I would in many ways like to sympathise and join XR, having been on protests and marches myself in London. But I don't know how I can reconcile it with the fact that you've got co-founder Brian Bowsden, who claims that heterosexuality is not normal and that seems to be strange when 95% of the world is heterosexual when you've got your other co-founder Roger Hallam becoming a doctor of philosophy in civil disobedience and then with the uh, billionaire Sir Christopher Hone giving 600 not giving, yes, yeah, first of all giving £200,000 to XR but also investing £630 million in the company that owns Heathrow Airport and wants to build a third runway and destroy a massive village, massive amounts of agricultural land for a third runway. I don't see how I can reconcile myself with joining you. Now, 1850, when you had one of your points about CO2, that was about the end of the Little Ice Age, of which you've heard which started in about 1300. The Industrial Revolution began about 1750, 100 years before that. The last ice fair on the Thames was about 1860, but the Thames was totally frozen over. And you've had your one degree rise of temperature from then right through to now, which I maintain, could be wrong, is the end of the Little Ice Age as much as anything else. Although, with the population now of seven and three quarter billion people in the world, obviously it has an effect. The temperature here in Bournemouth, where we are now, is a lot higher than out in the middle of Dorset. Humans do make a temperature change and so on. And of course, the effect of CO2, etc, etc. Eric, can you let him yeah. answer before you... Yes, please, please answer, okay. yes, okay. Um, which bit would you prefer me to answer? <laughs> let, let me try my best. Okay, so, as I've said, XR is flatline self-organising. Yes, the founders have their own opinions, so do loads of other people in XR, as in what everyone's opinion is. Um, personally, I don't agree with what they've said, and that's me personally. 
but I think that the issue at hand and what XR is doing is far, far, far bigger than any one individual and their opinions, however abhorrent they may be, because I don't know the opinions of what many members would think, and a lot of them, yeah, I may not associate myself with at all, but when you have something which is so big, you are going to have a wide, wide range of views, and it's a single issue group. With regards to the Little Ice Age and climate and saying how it all is, I'm not an expert in the science. I believe the consensus of 97.5% of scientists, I believe the consensus of NASA and some of the biggest scientific researchers, bodies which are telling us that this is happening, this is due to man-made <coughs> issues, and we can make a change. I agree with I agree with you very much. It's, it's man-made, or but I I do not agree that the, the climate change is totally man-made. When you have the effect of the sun, and you've got other natural things having of the five extinctions, or what, what it was before, yeah. there were massive extinctions, all natural, down to in one of the ninety-six percent of species was made extinct, which left four percent left. So the next extinction only had 4% of that one to deal with. The next one, whatever the percentage you have with. But we've now got, according to scientists, a trillion, trillion species in the country, now, in the world now. So I, I don't see how that works. But uh, you're talking... Uh, Eric, you've had a big... Uh, you've had two bites of the cherry. I'm just going to let um, Chris reply to that. And then we'll move on to the next one. Yeah, have a yeah. chance because we're running out of time. But thank you. Let's. Uh... I'll say one, one more brief thing. You talked about. <laughs> uh, this is very, very brief and very pertinent. Uh, uh, the austerity of the war, World War Two, ended about 1955. That was when commercial television came into use in Britain, when advertising hit every home. And what is behind a lot of people buying things all the time is advertising. You've got 24 hour absolutely 360 degree advertising for some people. And that, I'm sure, is a lot to do with what is your problem. <laughs> no, I don't know how to respond, to be honest. That's, I, I didn't hear a real okay. question. Okay, okay. okay. Um, Jeremy, have you still got a quick question? Yeah. We're nearly out of time. I'll just take one more at the back there. Um, so we'll go to Jeremy first, and then the gentleman uh, back, and then we need to wrap up. Hearing your, your, <coughs> excuse me, hearing your response to my suggestion that uh, XR should, should focus um, its direct action on mass demonstrations outside the embassies the worst polluters. Um, I, have to, I have to say that I'm, I'm disappointed by your reaction to that suggestion because I think it is a, um, it, it'll, it'll do, it'll achieve a lot of things. A, it'll publicize to the, the mass body of the British and hopefully international public who the worst polluters are. And you just don't seem to understand that, the value of doing that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to, I have to be a bit blunt on this. No, because, no, the truth. We all know it. Because, because, yes, I know, but how, how many people, I'm talking about the general public, are aware of that? You know, there's a permanent protest in front of Ch uh, the Chinese embassy about the treatment of certain people, and it's been going for many, many years. Mm -hmm. They don't care about um, small communities outside other embassies in other countries. Uh, it's not a thing. I, I don't think you understand the point I'm making. What I'm saying to you is, the... And I'm, I'm sorry to go on like this. To me, you, you, your major objective, goal, as an organization, should be education of the mass public and better publicity. You don't have very good publicity at the moment, I don't think. Um, and this can be best achieved by having targeted demonstrations outside the, the worst polluters' embassies. That will be headline news. It will finally get through to the, the, the British public in particular who these worst polluters are. If you were to stop people in the street and say, who do you think the worst polluters are? I doubt whether more than one in 20 could give an educated answer. Thank you. Do you want to 
Yeah, sure. Um, I kind of, I mean, to say that I don't understand, I do understand what you're saying. I understand completely what you're saying. And I don't think that it would have the same impact having a demonstration outside someone else's embassy when we can actually make change to our government where they're doing things. Now, I just want to tackle the biggest polluters thing as well because you told, you told me I didn't understand that. So I'm going to tell you who the biggest polluters are. Okay? And yeah, you've named countries. But how about the actual biggest polluters? What about JP Morgan, who fund massive amounts of fossil fuel extraction? What about Barclays, who are putting um, pipe work across indigenous lands in Canada to get the um, tar sands to bring more funding up? What about RBS? What about the Bank of America? What about the investment of all these pension funds and everything? These are the biggest polluters because they are financing it. So, if we want targeted actions, yeah, we can go to an embassy or we can go direct to the source. Okay. 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 I think what you do is brilliant because you're bringing the subject out into the public and I think um, the next generation of young kids will really change things and they're really right on it so hopefully they're kind of changing things around. Um, talking, I work in financial services so I know we're kind of the enemy but um, um, just to let you know, uh, loads of people in financial services now have portfolios which are environmentally, environmentally friendly very green thinking and forward thinking, so that's changing. Um, and I just wondered, if, like with Facebook now, they, they've said that um, they're going to go carbon neutral for by 2025, and whether they're going to have a huge impact on other companies. I think anyone like Facebook or any company which has a massive, massive brand hand can make that change and that commitment i they should be applauded for what they're doing and what i'd love to see is companies where they because facebook let's face it don't have a lot of competition companies where competition is available between large companies if one was to make the same commitment and see people change to use that brand i think that's where we can really kick things off from the corporate perspective and if people opt to choose the least polluting option and they, that is seen to happen I think that's going to make an absolute massive change to like I said society and the way in which we view things so yeah I'm really really in favour of yeah. anything like that. Um, I'm interested, this is um, I'm interested in XR's um, non Bond approach to its protests, but for those attending the events and then finding them getting themselves arrested for obstruction or whatever, what are their person? What are the ramifications for them personally, and how does that impact their later lives if they are actually subjected to uh, action by the police? So, like any criminal activity, it would depend what you were doing and what reasons you were arrested for. Um, most people who have been arrested to this point have been arrested for um, breaching a section 14 order, which is express or notice. And most people have received a conditional discharge and had to pay court fees for it. The impact of that is you do have a criminal record until that um, <coughs> becomes spent, which for conditional discharge becomes spent for the length of time which you have that, so be it 9 months, 12 months, whatever. In that time, you are affected in the same way that um, having any criminal record would be and be viewed. So if you were trying to get a visa to say go to America or something like that, you may not be successful getting it. Um, and obviously a lot of like insurances and financial products and stuff like that do take into account criminal records. So, mostly, it's a very minor offence and it doesn't have an impact. Um, 
personally, I'm getting a new mortgage, and I told the um, provider that it was happening, and they were like, yeah, not a problem. So it really, really depends entirely, like I say, on the charges and what happens, but generally, it'll have a short impact on your criminal record. Chris, I think you've done a brilliant job tonight. You've been really clear and you've, you've taken a lot of tough questions. So we're going to give you some totally non-polluting wine for you to take away with you. Will you please give Chris a big round of applause?